Sometimes we are missing the truth or 
Let me burn a bit and I will find it. Let us see as the Lord will clear today in this part. First of all, in verse 9, the first verse to read today. Then he began to tell the people this parable. A certain man landed a vineyard, leaved it to buy letter, and went into a far country for a long time. God is good. He made this paradise and gave it to Adam and Eve. He gave me your life. He gave you life. He gave you future and time. And it's his vineyard. And he lets you to do whatever you want. But he is telling you from the beginning, it's a leaf. It's not your body. It's, it's something that's called my own temple, and I entrusted you for it. It's not your own family. It's my family, and I entrusted you for it. So God is good, and He offers everything out of goodness to every one of us. Then some of us missed that message, misused the gift, misused the paradise, misused the family, misused the relationship. So I think God and a patient God. So first, he's a good God, and secondly, he's a patient God. In verses 10 to 12 today, <clears throat> three times, he sends a servant to the vine dresser. Again, he sends another servant, and again, he sends a third one. And then he is asking me and you this morning, are you waiting for the fourth one? Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't tell us that there is a fourth one. It doesn't mean that we have only three chances, but you have a chance today, and there is no guarantee there is a chance tomorrow. That's the center of God is giving us. God is giving us <clears throat> the promise to forgive when we repent. But there is, there is no promise. If you procrastinate, I'm going to do another day to repent. So he's encouraging us to use this patience. He says in Romans chapter 2 and verse 4 that his patience is to lead us to repentance, not to have more stubbornness in our heart. So, firstly, the truth about him is a good God giving us a paradise. The patient God giving us many chances, and then he's a loving God. Verse 13, then the owner of the vineyard said, what shall I do? I will send my beloved son, probably they will respect him, then when they see him. He sent his own son, and the church is based with her belief on the coming of his only begotten son. The whole church and all the Old were based the belief that waiting the coming of the son. We are enjoying now that he came. To restore what we have done, to restore what the first Adam did, to enjoy the fullness of the restored paradise once more. But again, he's a good God, a patient God, and loving God. And till this moment, or till this point, he will see that it's good to follow him. And it's good to rely on his patience, to rely on his loving kindness. But he's telling us that he's also he's a holy God. And this is a part that we don't want to hear always. The following verse, 13 and 16, So they cast him out of the vineyard <coughs> and killed him. <coughs> Therefore, what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those <coughs> like letters and give the vineyard to others. And when they heard it, they said, Certainly not. And this is a very important thing. That is telling me, I'm patient for you. I'm waiting for you to come back to your senses. To be able to say sorry. To be able to choose to repent, to be able to choose to confess your sin, which means you never did in your life. Otherwise, I'm a holy God. I can't fear you anymore. For the church is encouraging us to, to repent and not to fear our God because He's a Father, but He's a holy Father. That's why, in many occasions, the word holy has no sense, <coughs> it has no meaning in my mind. But He's reminding us in this paragraph when I'm saying God is holy. It means he has the right to judge his people. And his judgment is full of righteousness and right. And then there was a choice in front of those who listened to this father. Then he looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whoever it falls, it will grind him to powder. Is a choice. Either to use this cornerstone to be part of your building, to enrich your faith, to use it for your own restoration, or otherwise you will move it to the place. That's why St. Moses is encouraging us to apply. Show before him your feebleness, your weakness. Unfortunately, even this becomes a stumbling block to 
and we will reject to show the Lord. <clears throat> show me for whom you will be, and you will become unto the mind. We need the mind because we are not able to profess it. I'm talking to you that we can do this. Unfortunately, those who have been at the time <clears throat> choose the wrong, wrong decision. Okay? And the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him, just because we have the truth. We want him to tell him you are good as you are. We don't want to hear that he is a holy God going to judge those who reject the Son. Not only theoretically, but to reject the power of the Son in their lives. But we feel the evil for they knew he had spoken his parable against them. Yes, he's telling me any of these words is related to you personally. I'm talking to you personally, not to anyone else. Not to your wife, not to your husband, not to your children, to you personally. But it's time to take the right decision. And Peter was encouraging us to say maybe the same word. He's collecting all the Bible in a few verses. Therefore, to you who believe he is precious. But to those who are disobedient, again, the stone which the builder rejected has become the chief corner stone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of stumbling. What is your choice? To be those who believe is, he is precious, or those who disobey, who are not enjoying him. Thus, they stumble being disobedient to the word. If the word is not open before my eyes, definitely I am disobedient. Some people believe that because I'm not opening my Bible, I'm not reading, then I am exempted from this. No. It's more words that we reject the life of Christ. Today, as we heard in the Trinitarium, we celebrated the departure of King Hezekiah, one of the greatest kings in the history of the kingdom of Judah. And as his holiness spoke, the Bible was urging us, his past to pray and to pass to our persecuted brothers and sisters all over the Middle East, in Iraq, in Syria, and Palestine, and everywhere. Let me remind you of the word of Hezekiah. Hezekiah before we start, he was raised, he reigned in the year 680 BC. So 680, and his forefather, King Solomon, died nine years. So nearly 250 years, the whole kingdom of Israel and Judah never celebrated a feast of Passover. So the first thing he did, in the first day, the first month of his reign, as we can read in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, he called for a Passover. Still, the two kingdoms were divided, but he chose to make a unity and to bring both of them together. And he was, he said, to his people. He was to the north and the south. And this was mainly was for the north kingdom. At the time, the kingdom of the north was taken into captivity in Assyria, by the Assyrians. So he's talking to the remnants of those who are still living in Jerusalem or in Israel. Verse 7. Tonight. And do not delight your fathers and your brethren who depart against the Lord God of their fathers. It's a choice. You think in what you suffer from now it was a choice of your father. They rebel from the grace against the father, the Lord God of their fathers. So that he gave them up to desolation as you see. And you think and you, your sin here will affect your brother in Egypt, affect your brother in Sudan. In, in, in Iraq, in Syria, in, anywhere. Then he added, Now do not be stiff next as your father prayed. It's a time of obedience. Now do not be stiff next as your father prayed. But give yourself to the Lord and enter his sanctuary, which he has sanctified forever. And tell the Lord your God that the fearness of the grass may turn away from you. Why? Because it's your choice. And then he's telling you at me now, your repentance today will affect the whole world. Your repentance is so effective. Verse 9, for if you return to the Lord, your brother, your brethren, and your children will be treated with compassion by those who lead them captive, so that they may come back to this land. The restoration is going to happen when you repent. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn his face from you if you return to him. It seems quite strange, but it's very real and tested many times with all this and any different. My repentance here will affect my brother and sister in Egypt, in Syria, in Iraq, in Sudan, in Palestine.